Welcome to this presentation about authoring workflows for believable terrain and vegetation within Unity. Hopefully after this presentation, you'll have a better understanding of the recently added and available resources for creating your own believable terrain. My name is Barrington Campbell. I'm a technical artist within the terrain team at Unity. I specialize in tools development and improving user experiences within the editor. Previous to Unity, I acquired a game design and development degree from Rochester Institute of Technology and worked in the AA as well as the Indie space. Within this video, I'll briefly go over exporting SpeedTree assets to your Unity project, the new features and updates for SpeedTree 8, how to use the new detail instancing mode to paint instance details on HDRP terrain, and lastly, add a distance fade and terrain layer blending effect to instance details using Shadergraph. When it comes to vegetation on terrains, one of the first aspects that springs to mind is trees. Creating believable trees from scratch can be quite a painful process, so the team over at Interactive Data Visualization has been working on Speed Tree to deal with this hurdle. With the help of the terrain team at Unity, we've updated and added new features allowing you, the artist, to utilize the latest installment of SpeedTree as a DCC of choice for creating trees and helping you stay in flow longer. Let's jump into SpeedTree to edit and export trees to Unity. For this presentation, I'm using the latest version of SpeedTree 8.5. Now that we're in SpeedTree, we can start working on exporting a tree model. When opening SpeedTree, you'll be presented with five tree models that are free and accessible for use within any project. These free tree models are a great starting point for familiarizing yourself with the editing and exporting of trees from SpeedTree. Let's use the conifer tree for our terrain. To export a tree, go to File, Export to game. An export mesh window will appear. I'm exporting directly to my Unity project asset folder. You'll then be prompted with an export to game window which requires a few changes. To make life easier, you can start by selecting the Unity preset within the preset dropdown. Customizing the exportation settings depends on your project's needs. For example, if you desire to achieve better performance, you can select LODs plus billboard under the LOD section to export the full LOD chain with billboard cards. Within the include section, enabling variations tells the exporter to create new materials and textures with embedded variation information. Also, enabling scene blending adds small pieces of geometry to the model, hiding any unwanted intersections of the branch and its parent. Under the Atlas section, you can select the aggressiveness of the Atlas wrapping. To minimize draw calls and memory consumption, a more aggressive wrapping is recommended. We'll select everything, which atlases all the materials of the tree to help with performance. The geometry section is used to arrange the tree's transformation to meet the requirements of the engine or software you're exporting to. Using the preset dropdown pre-populates the proper settings for the selected software. Lastly, the texture section is used to alter the resolution and formats of the exported textures, which is useful for minimizing memory consumption or increasing texture quality. Once the desired settings are selected, you can click OK, wait for exportation to complete, and transition to Unity. As of the recording, we're using Unity 2021.2 Beta 1 for this HDRP project. You'll be able to use the same features in this video with newer editor versions as well. After the speed tree assets are imported, the normal map settings window will pop up. Make sure to click the fix button to assign the proper normal settings. Within the project window, we can find the exported speed tree assets. If you follow the previous speed tree exportation settings, you should see the trees .sd file shorthand for speed tree and the big textures for the billboard as well as the model. One benefit to using the latest SpeedTree 8 assets is the ability to make shader changes to your trees within Shadergraph. Unlike the previous SpeedTree shader, importing SpeedTree 8 assets automatically assigns a SpeedTree Shadergraph within HDRP. The Shadergraph is also SRP battery compatible while not using wind. 
To access the tree's materials in Shadergraph, first select the speed tree model within the project view. Then select the materials tab within the tree's import settings inspector window. Lastly, click extract materials. After the materials are extracted, you can access the shader by selecting the materials and clicking edit. Within the speed tree 8 shader, you have access to the normals, subsurface scattering, billboard, wind, and more. Editing the subgraph gives you full control over how you want your trees rendered. With all the necessary assets properly imported, we can begin adding trees to the world using one of two approaches. The first approach is by individually hand placing the trees. Simply select the tree model within the project folder and drag it into the scene. Hand placing trees gives you the greatest control over the tree's positioning. The second approach is by using Terrain's tree brush to paint or mass place trees. To start painting trees, you'll need to select the terrain and then the tree brush. Click Edit Trees, Add Trees, Assign the Speed Tree Model, and finally click Add. From this point, you can start painting individual trees or mass place them with one click. With the trees placed in our scene, we can then begin adding terrain details. Terrain details within Unity are considered foliage assets that are not trees. For example, bushes, flowers, and grass. Unlike trees, details cannot utilize LODs in collision detection, but are more performant when rendering a greater amount of foliage. The new instance details greatly improve on the performance while adding new features. Here's a comparison between the new instance and the original billboard details. Starting out with details instance limit. The new instance details does not have an instance count limit, while billboard details is limited per patch. In terms of shaders, instance details can utilize any shader including those created within Shadergraph, while the billboard grass is limited to the built-in grass shader. For hardware usage, instance details improves on leveraging more of the GPU, which minimizes CPU overhead compared to the billboard details. Lastly, details are now supported on HDRP when using instance details. Now that we have a better understanding of the differences, let's see how we can paint instance details on HDRP terrain. To begin painting instance details, you need to select a terrain and then the paint details brush. Click Edit Details, Add Details, Assign the Details Prefab, make sure to have Use GPU Instancing enabled, and click Add. From there you can start painting. With the details painted, we can begin breaking down the custom grass shader graph, highlighting new shader graph features that lend to creating effects for believable details. To begin, we'll first need to access the graph. A simple way to access the shader graph is through the details material. First, we'll select the grass material within the project view. Within the materials inspector view, there's an edit button. Clicking this button will direct you to the graph view of the material shader graph. Within the graph view, there are a few key settings worth highlighting when creating shader graph shaders specifically for details. The first setting is material type. Material type determines the underlying material that is most suitable for your assets, with translucent material type being the recommended choice for details. Unlike the subsurface scattering material type, the translucent type doesn't blur light that transmits through the material. Utilizing the translucent type enables subsurface scattering using a thickness map and diffusion profile. In this instance, we're using the default foliage diffusion profile from HDRP. To minimize on performance degradation, it's also recommended to use alpha clipping. Alpha clipping utilizes the alpha channel of the base map texture and the float value for the clipping threshold. 
Now with the detail setting established, let's dive into the new custom interpolated features used to make believable detail effects. Custom interpolators allow you to perform calculations in the vertex stage and pass the results directly to the fragment stage. Creating a custom interpolator is fairly simple and intuitive. First, you'll select one of the nodes within the master stack. Then you can press the space key to access the create node window. Within the window, you'll see an option for creating a custom interpolator. With the newly created custom interpolator selected, you can edit its graph properties from the inspector view. The precision field determines the floating point precision of the result. The name field prescribes a name to use for referencing. And the property type determines what data type to use for input and output of the custom interpolator. Accessing the interpolator results is similar to adding other nodes to the graph view. Start by pressing the space key or right clicking within the graph view to access the create node window. Then open the custom interpolator dropdown. Within the dropdown, you can select the desired custom interpolator. Simply drag and connect the pin to access the interpolator's results. Now that we understand how to create the interpolators, Let's look at a few examples of how this shader utilizes custom interpolators for distance fade and blending terrain colors. Distance fade is a useful technique not only for enhancing the visual quality of details on terrain, but also for improving performance. Thanks to the latest updates of instance details, we can now achieve these effects using per instance positions. Let's dive back into ShaderGraph to see how distance fade is handled. Within the Vertex stage, there are two custom interpolators used for handling distance fade. The first interpolator determines the intensity value of the fade utilizing the detail distance from the camera. The second interpolator determines the falloff or transition point of the distance fade color. These two interpolators are connected to a distance cutoff subgraph that utilizes the three shader graph parameters we previously changed in the scene view. Let's open the distance cutoff subgraph to better understand how the fade results are calculated. The distance cutoff subgraph utilizes the position of the camera and detail instance to calculate the distance between the two points using a variation of the Manhattan distance formula. The remap distance is then used to determine the output values of the vertex wave animation movement cutoff, the fade start and end distance lurping between 0 and 1, as well as the color falloff transition also lurking between 0 and 1. Back in the main graph view, both the fade and falloff outputs are then piped directly into the interpolator, while the movement output is utilized in the wind vertex animation calculation. Transitioning to the fragment stage within the graph view allows us to see how the custom interpolator results are incorporated. The fade interpolator value is passed through both a smooth step and lerp node to finally be used as the power of the base map texture. The result is then piped into the alpha channel for faded alpha clipping. The falloff interpolator value is multiplied by the W or alpha channel of the fade color. The purpose of this channel is to be used as an intensity value. The result of the multiplication is then raised and lurked with the fade color creating the distance faded falloff color. Now that we better understand the distance fade technique, we can transition to seeing how the shader handles terrain color blending. Terrain color blending is a great technique for unifying your details within a terrain. The blending technique utilizes the terrain's alpha map to identify the terrain layer color to blend. Each channel gets a separate color. These colors correspond to what type of terrain layer is painted in that channel. For example, the B channel in the terrain alpha map is designated to soil. To match the soil, splat B's color parameter is set to brown and blended in the detail scattered over the soil texture. The shader graph also takes into consideration the terrain size and world position for mapping UVs.
Let's see how the UVs are calculated and the process of blending terrain colors within the graph view. Back in the graph view, we can look at the terrain space UV group, which calculates the results passed to the Vector2 custom terrain UV interpolator. The calculation begins with getting the absolute world position of the detail instance. A swivel node is used to mask the X and Z channels. The return vector 2 is then transformed into terrain space by subtracting the terrain origin and dividing the scale. The final transform value is passed to the custom terrain UV interpolator. Transitioning to the fragment stage, we can see how the custom UV is incorporated into blending. Fragment blending begins by sampling the terrain spot map using the calculation results from the custom terrain UV interpolator. The sampled fragment channels are then multiplied by their respective blend colors. The multiplied colors are then blended together using interconnected LERP nodes. The result is then passed to a branch for toggling the blend effect and lurped with the fade color before being piped into the base color of the fragment master node. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation and have taken away some useful information on authoring workflows for believable terrain and vegetation within Unity.